Our next speaker is known as Twitter's gynecologist, where she has more than 350,000 followers. She's a fierce advocate for women's health, whose mission is to build a better medical internet. She's the host of the TED podcast, Body Stuff, and of the streaming doc docuseries, Gensplaining. She's also the author of the best-selling books, The Vagina Bible, and more recently, The Menopause Manifesto. Here to tell us all about the menopause, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Jen Gunter. Hi, I'm Dr. Jen Gunter. I'm an OBGYN and I'm author of the book, The Menopause Manifesto. And I'm going to have a little chat with you today about menopause. Specifically, menopause is having a moment. So by the numbers, menopause is increasing due to our increasing population and also the longer lifespans that we have. So in 1990, there were 471 million women worldwide in menopause. And by 2025, that projection is to be over 1 billion. So this is something that's going to happen to basically, you know, half the population at any given time. And so this isn't some niche Thing. This isn't some, you know, side medical event. This is really a main event for half the population. Now, before I get started talking about anything else, I want to just talk a little bit about what menopause is, because sometimes there's a lot of confusion. Is it premenopause? Is it perimenopause? Is it postmenopause? What does that even mean? So menopause is the planned end of ovarian function. So this has always been sort of the evolutionary plan or for the last, you know, tens of thousands of years that ovulation would stop. And the time, the actual date of sort of the last the last menstrual period is the final menstrual period is medical menopause. And afterwards, we say everything is postmenopause. The time leading up to that is called the menopause transition, which you might think a little bit like puberty, but in reverse. Where it gets a bit confusing is that there's a lot of other terms that are used. So premenopause is sometimes used for the menopause transition, and perimenopause is sometimes used for the menopause transition plus a year after the final menstrual period. And to add to the confusion, you know, we can't really say that you've had your last period until you're a year after. So menopause is diagnosed sort of in retrospect. So all of that sort of adds to the confusion of it. But I think what's really important for people to understand is that menopause is really a continuum. You know, whether someone is in their menopause transition, meaning they're a year or two from their final period, or they're a year or two after, they really face the same health concerns, um, the same uh, biological pressures. And so really, it's helpful to think of the whole thing as an experience or the whole thing as a continuum. And it's also important to really drive home the point that this is a normal phase of life. This is like childhood, like puberty, like pregnancy. This is a normal thing. This isn't a disease. Now, despite the fact that there's going to be a billion women, despite the fact that this is a normal phase of life, 65% of women feel unprepared for menopause. And that's a problem. And part of that, or a large part of it, stems from this relatively sort of modern thinking of menopause as a disease. But I always like to say if menopause is a disease, then so is being a man, because it is really a normal biological thing. So some of this comes from the fact that we have tied the worth of a woman to sort of very narrow reproductive capabilities, meaning being a breeder. We have in Western medicine this long legacy from back to the days of you know, ancient Greek medicine, that this belief that menstrual fluid was toxic. And so if you're going through menopause and you're not bleeding anymore, well, obviously those toxins are accumulating. Uh, and we've historically, and even very recently, sort of compared uh, ovaries to testicles, this sort of idea that if sperm can still be produced at the age of 70, the fact that ovulation isn't happening means that ovulation is somehow lesser or there's a problem. When, of course, you know, we wouldn't compare the spleen to the kidneys and say, well, you know, the kidneys are a lesser organ because they don't produce blood. So I think it's a really important point to sort of say, you know, these are, whether you have ovaries, whether you have testicles, those are very different biologically, and those two shouldn't be compared. 
But where sort of the, I would say the icing on the cake for menopause as a disease really came into play was in the 1950s and 60s. This book that I have a picture here of, Feminine Forever, uh, was uh, published in 1966 and really advanced this false notion that uh, women were all meant to die before menopause. And so menopause is a disease uncovered by the gifts of modern society, like vaccinations and clean water and things like that. Now, at the time this book was published, you know, the average lifespan for a woman was still three to four years longer than a man. So it's pretty hard to position it as a disease. Uh, but this idea was really promoted heavily by the pharmaceutical industry, this concept of menopause as a disease. Because if you want to sell a cure, right, you have to make it glamorous. Glamorous. You have to make it something that, you know, women outlive their ovaries. Well, that was kind of always the plan to do that. So, you know, a lot of this is uh, sort of this historical um, view of being female as being lesser, this sort of modern recreation of menopause as a disease to really sell pharmaceuticals. So it's really important to have an understanding of that history. So, I said that menopause was normal, and it really is, because we have this great data to tell us uh, something about our evolution, and it's called the grandmother hypothesis, or really the wise woman hypothesis. And this idea is that menopause provided an evolutionary advantage. So basically, when a family had a grandmother, they had more grandchildren. And if you think about it, having a kid is incredibly taxing, not only to your, your body, but to your, um, to your family unit. You have extra food to find, extra shelter. Somebody may be less able to go out and find food and shelter if they've just had a child. And so having a capable pair of hands in the household or around the household to help allowed you to have more children. But you can only be helpful if you are not burdened with childbearing yourself. And that's really the grandmother hypothesis. And there's excellent data to support it. And the fact that we all graduate from school and we don't learn this along with the theory of evolution is really, um, again, a testimony to, I think, um, our patriarchal society, that this is a really important thing to sort of explain from the get-go that menopause is not a failure, it's actually an important part of evolution. Now, that being said, you can still have symptoms and health concerns, right? You know, evolution only has to be good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. And so some of the symptoms and health concerns that go along with menopause are abnormal menstrual bleeding, hot flushes, sleep disturbance, temporary cognitive changes, vaginal dryness, and joint pain. And there's also medical conditions that start to increase around the time of the menopause transition and during um, and after the final menstrual period, such as heart disease, osteoporosis, dementia urinary tract infections, depression, and type 2 diabetes. So there are very real medical needs here, just like there's real medical needs in puberty or real medical needs uh, during pregnancy or real medical needs at any phase of our lives. So the problem is we have, you know, over 60% of women feeling unprepared for menopause. We have all of these medical conditions that are associated with it. And so we have gaps. So many women don't get the care that they need. That is really true. There are conflicting studies. How do you know which one to believe? Some symptoms don't yet have effective therapies. You know, sometimes science hasn't caught up with what we need. We have changing guidelines. And so this is perceived as indecision. And I think that, um, that the COVID pandemic has really shown how as science changes, that indecision makes people really question what they're hearing in general. And so we get that that's been a real issue with menopause. In medicine, the length of time from new information to adoption and practice is generally quite slow, 15 to 17 years, which is not acceptable. And I'm not saying it is, but understanding the gaps is important. And then we have poor communication, whether that's a 20 minute office visit, um, the, you know, the length of time of appointments, actual communication skills, and we have an ageist and sexist society. So a lot of issues. And so this menopause vacuum has also been exacerbated by this big study that came out in 20, 2002, which we are still seeing repercussions from. So in 1992, the American College of Physicians and basically every medical society recommended that all postmenopausal women take estrogen. And by 2001, 42% of postmenopausal women in the U.S. were on estrogen. 
In 2002, the Women's Health Initiative, which was this large prospective study to actually prove whether estrogen was as beneficial as we thought, was halted. And I'm not going to go into all of the reasons it was halted and all of the problems associated with that, but suffice it to say, many things were not translated well to the general population, and it created a fear of menopausal hormone therapy estrogen that really wasn't supported actually by the studies. So we had this gap sort of in time where people were afraid to prescribe estrogen because this crazy study had just been published. It's not really crazy, but you know, this study that got everybody really worked up was published and people didn't really know what to do. Was it okay to prescribe? Was it okay not to? And into that vacuum walked alternative medicine. And, you know, one of the biggest offenders is Dr. Christiane Northrup, who has been labeled by the Center for Digital Hate as also one of the 12 people spreading, you know, most of the lies about the coronavirus. So just in important to sort of, um, that misinformation has always been there from her. And she was on Oprah in January, 2009 to promote bioidentical hormones, which is really a nonsensical term. And when is the biggest Google search for, um, bioidentical hormones, January, 2009. And so, you know, there was that vacuum there that someone like her was able to step into and promote these therapies that are really, you know, have concerns associated with them. Uh, so, we still have this problem though. So we have these gaps and if medicine isn't listening or providing options, where do women turn? It wouldn't be surprising that everybody would go online and search after listening to Northrup on Oprah. These things aren't surprising. So we have to actually step up and say, you know, there are these issues. We have actually good data and good science. We just have to get it out to people and we have to communicate better. So, People are demanding a modern menopause, and they should. Women are beginning to finally share experiences online. They need community. There has been this long culture of silence with menopause because there's nothing worse, worse in a patriarchal society than an aging women's body. And we're beginning to demand access to care and for better care, and all of these things are true and are needed, and we need to support. And so... One of the things that we're starting to see as this sort of modern menopause is finally coming to fruition is, of course, the emergence of femtech. And we have to ask ourselves, is this exploiting the gaps or is this filling the needs? And these are some recent headlines you know, from the New York Times, from Forbes, from, um, you know, uh, about also about, you know, startups. So people are promoting new products as an answer. They're promoting social networks as an answer. And, you know, we have to look at these things very carefully and make sure that we are not exploiting the same gaps, that this is not sort of reinventing the exploitation wheel, if you will. So if Femtech has a product, you know, what medical concern is the product addressing? Women need options, and I get a pitch from femtech companies every few days, and that's the number one thing they say to me, women need options. Okay, well, so what options specifically? What is the problem you're trying to fix or problem you're trying to solve? Women need options is a deflection. It's not an actual you know, medical issue. And if they're filling a need, how are they going to do that? Are they going to go straight from fundraising to product marketing, or are they actually going to prove their product works? Um, are they using marketing terms or medical terms? If it's telehealth, how's the quality monitored? A lot of these telehealth companies that are starting to pop up in menopause, they all say that they're going to they're going to recommend the right supplements. Well, there really aren't many supplements that actually do anything for menopause. So these kinds of things, like you know, always get me concerned. If it's a social network, how's the quality of the content that's shared going to be curated? I think again, we've seen with the coronavirus that the way medical disinformation and misinformation is shared on social media has real ramifications. Is this repackaging something that's already available? And if so, does it even work? A lot of these sort of so-called so femtech companies are really just repackaging supplements along with an app that's going to help you decide how to use the supplement. And of course, you know, if a supplement really worked, that would be part of standard medical care and we'd be prescribing it or recommending it. 
And finally, we're seeing this explosion of sort of home hormone testing or other ways of hormone testing. And that's largely not indicated. Um, and so, you know, what need are these hormone testing markets filling? They're, they're, they're not filling a medical need. Um, and, you know, many of these hormone testing companies are also attached to, again, recommending supplements or sort of niche type of care. And so it's important, you know, when you're covering all these stories or, or reading about these new uh, companies to really, really ask these hard questions. And so, you know, I finally like to end with this is the only meme I've ever created, but, you know, science, the internet and snake oil. And, you know, it's very easy to put out, you know, low quality stuff. It's very easy to say you're solving a problem. Those are, it's very easy to say that you have a natural solution, but the way you fill a gap that we have in menopause is providing women with high quality medical care that's proven to be safe and effective. And I'll turn you back over to the folks at Wired. Thank you so much.